Two months later, Leeds reached their third FA Cup final. They'd lost the previous two, but in this, the centenary final against Arsenal, they finally got it right, thanks to Alan sniffer Clark. And McNabb only half stopping him, Jones getting it across, and Clark going in, and Alan Clark has put Leeds ahead! FA Cup success at last, but that same football association insisted that Leeds must go straight from Wembley to fulfil their final league fixture at Wolves two days later. Not just any old game this, a point would be enough to secure the double. After the game I was told my father had took ill and, and they'd brought him in, into the tunnel, the Wembley tunnel where the dressing rooms and I went to see him and he was with my mother and he was sitting in a chair. And he looked all right, he just says he just felt a bit dizzy and, and that. And then obviously right after that game, Don decided that he would whip his right up to, to Wolverhampton. I, I think at the time, I think you thought, whatever he says is law. You know, whatever he said we had to do, we did. I think that's where he probably made a mistake on that one. He should have allowed us to go and relax. Because we never really enjoyed winning that FA Cup. We were all experienced professionals who weren't going to get blotto um, but maybe just to have been at the event and enjoyed what uh, what winning the cup was all about might have been a good thing we were tired that day when you think uh, we just had a, an FA Cup end of the season extremely hard and then we had to play on the, on the Monday which was really diabolical when you think we could have played on a Wednesday Brian Clough's derby had already finished their season and were one point clear, but Leeds' superior goal difference meant a draw would be enough. Frank Munro struck first for Wolves, reminding the visitors how tired both minds and limbs were, and when Derek Dugan made it 2-0, Leeds were on their knees. Somehow Billy Bremner found the energy to lead a comeback, but fatigue had taken a huge toll. Cup success had cost Leeds the league. After I played in the game and... and uh... The Monday night Wolverhampton, which we lost and cost us a league. Um, Don came to him and says to me, my father was still in London, he had a bit of relapse. And I went down to London, um, and my mother was in London, staying in a little hotel, and we went to the hospital the next day, and they'd run tests with my dad, and at first they thought he had this slight heart attack, but then they found out my dad had uh, lung cancer, and he died in September. So it's mixed emotions for me, the, uh, the 72 cup final. Right after the game, you're delighted, and I heard my father was ill, you're a bit worried about that. And then after the game on the Monday, you know, when you travelled down, you realised how serious it was. It puts the game into perspective, though. Five years later, by which time Don Reavy had moved on to become the England manager, Newspaper allegations, which were never pursued in a court of law, suggested that Reavy had tried to fix the Wolves match and several other key games. Daily Mirror reporter Richard Stott broke the story after a chance remark by Alan Ball. I went to Southampton, where Alan Ball was playing, and uh, had a long lunch with him. And at the end of this very long lunch, um, he came out with this extraordinary story about Don Reavy. And that was that um, he was then the um, sort of great young star of Blackpool and uh, the England World Cup team. And uh, he was in dispute with Blackpool over his contract. And Reavy told him to make as much trouble as he possibly could and uh, he would pay him £100 a week and uh, that eventually Blackpool would get so fed up with him that uh, they would transfer him and he would come to Leeds. I was aware of his interest. Um, Don Revy himself never ever paid me any money, ever. But there was always somebody else who did. This set us going on uh, investigating Don Revy because clearly it was uh, an act of uh, corruption by Revy and indeed by, uh, by Alan Ball to take the money. There'd be a knock on, on my door and uh, invariably there'd be a, a man in rain, sunshine, Whatever, you just say, there's an, inv an investment for Mr. Ball, which I took. 
when I used to go away with Scotland and, and that, yeah, and, and listen to players who'd been transferred from club to club, and I used to hear about them getting a few quid, you know, the backhanders and all that that were going on. I think you had to be like that. I mean, I know, like Don would say to us, uh, if he fancied a player, or when when you're in the dressing room or when you're training, if you if you have a word with, you know, whatever player, um, tell him I wouldn't mind signing him and just see what his reaction is and tell him what a good club Leeds is, you know, and they would get they would do that, but it was going on all over. They, they were all doing it as well. Goalkeeper Gary Sprake was paid fifteen thousand pounds by the newspaper to tell his version of the story. I went to see him and um, put uh, the question that Revy might have been um, trying to buy matches um, from other, uh, opposing teams. And uh, astonishingly, he admitted it uh, there and then. But the problem with it was that we couldn't isolate the games. Of course, he knew about the Wolves game um, immediately after Leeds had won the Cup and were out to get the double. So uh, we debriefed uh, Gary Sprake as much as we possibly could and then got him under contract. Well, it makes you wonder where these things come from. Who invents them? I mean, we, we, were, we had just won the Cup on the Saturday and we went to Wolverhampton. I, I would have thought there would have been something amiss more if we had won. Fleet Street is not a naive constituency. Um, but I don't, I, I, it's impossible to think of anything in that game which would have suggested that was right. Now, if Wolves gave an honest performance, um, having decided not to take a bribe, it didn't look like that to me because once that kind of thing is, is in the air at a match, and there's been a few dodgy games down the years, there's always an, a kind of atmosphere about it that something's not quite right. You always sense that something's not quite right, no matter which way it goes. And I don't recall anyone having any suspicion at the time. Gary and a lot of the boys grew up a long period of time together and it distanced them for the rest of the players and when we have any reunions now or any functions Gary's never there which is quite sad really because Gary played a lot of games for the club. After that article I don't think anybody has any time for him to be quite honest with you. Um, sad but um, you know we feel in, in him saying that he let us down as well because it put a stigma over our whole 12, 15 years together where we'd been wonderfully successful. If I saw him, I'd say hello, Gary, but I wouldn't give him, you know, much time in all honesty because I do feel he let our side down. Next week, what a save and what an upset. Give me the same ball, the same thing. I'd hit it just the same and I know uh, the other 999 times out of 1,000 it would have gone in. And 44 days in the life of Brian, from titles to turmoil. He sat us down and he just turned around and he said, You see you lot? I played under Revy. See all the caps and the medals that you won? You should find a dustbin and chuck them in there because you cheated for those. <laughs>